All right, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to open them up to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew in chapter number 14. Matthew chapter 14. Again, we're going to take a little break here from our uh, sermon series through Philippians. We'll get back to it um, in the coming weeks. Uh, but I wanted to try to just spend a few minutes together, and I won't be lengthy this morning. And I know many of you afterwards don't feel like you need to stick around and fellowship and howdy doody if you wouldn't like to. Just, you know, if you want to get in your car and go home, that's fine. So everyone needs to react. Uh, part of this is. Uh, this situation is, we're discovering is we we all, we really like to have input how, on on how others react right like well they shouldn't react this way they shouldn't feel this way and usually almost always when Jesus is speaking in these kind of situations uh, he turns from the they to the me right how am I reacting how am I viewing this and uh, you know if if you don't like how your friends on Facebook are reacting I want to give you a really good response to that. Don't get on Facebook, right? Just choose to take some time away. Oh, no, I've got to correct every wrong Facebook post that my friend puts out there. I've got to get on there. No, we don't have to, right? We don't, we don't have to get into it. We don't have to argue back and forth. If you think that this whole coronavirus thing is way overplayed, that's your opinion, and you can hold to that. If you think that this is something we really need to be serious about, and then, then that's where you're at, like, we probably just need to let every man be fully convinced of his own mind of what Romans 14 says, and just you know, make the best decision for us as individuals, for our families. Um, but the large majority of our culture is approaching this situation and their initial response is fear. Their initial response is uh, panic. Their response is, you know, buy all the toilet paper. And we can laugh and think how silly that is, but I bought toilet paper last week. Did we need toilet paper? No, but all you guys were going to buy it all, and when we needed it, I wasn't going to be able to get any, so I had to go, but no, you know, we, I, we, we're all so silly in it, but we're reacting in, in, out of uh, this spirit that I think I see in the, the disciples in Matthew 14, which is this moment of panic, it's this moment of confusion, it's this moment of concern, it's this moment of kind of if you feel like Jesus has a lack of concern for us, and I, I want to read the story for you. Matthew 14, we'll start in verse number 22. Again, this should be uh, in your outline that you received when you came in or in a Bible uh, in, a, in a seat pocket somewhere near you as well. But Matthew 14, verse 22, the Bible says, Straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. At this point, Jesus has amassed quite a following. He's got thousands of people following him from place to place. Right now, they're really focusing on Jesus' political possibilities that they, Jesus could maybe overthrow Rome with his miracles, with his power, and Jesus is trying to remove himself from those multitudes. So he sends the disciples into a boat and they're side away, and he is going to, verse number 23 says, when he sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. When the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship with his disciples was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spear, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered unto him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid again. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, why did you doubt? Wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, Of a truth. Thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. So Jesus sends his disciples into this situation. He then removes himself physically from the situation, and the disciples respond in fear. The experience here of the disciples in the storm can be an encouragement to us when we face the storms of life. When we find ourselves in the storm, we can rest on a few assurances. And what I want to give us this morning is just a few anchors. When your life is being tossed back and forth, when you don't know which way is up and which way is down, when one news 
station says it's this, and another news station says it's that. Okay, how are we supposed to respond? How can we have that security in the midst of the storm? One of the really healthy ways I have chosen to use the free, extra free time of not going out as much is I'm getting really into fishing shows, like um, people catching crabs and big fish, and like I'm, I'm into it, man. Like, a couple nights ago, Sarah asked, when did you come to bed? I don't know. I just kept watching fishing shows. Like, I, I don't know how long it took. I just kept going. Um, and my favorite ones are when they're, they're catching this fish or, you know, they're bringing up these lobsters or whatever they're catching, crabs. And uh, there's a big storm, right? And you see these boats, I mean, just getting tossed around like they're a bath toy back and forth. And these guys are on there with their rod and reels. They're on there with their nets, like not a like, like nothing's happening. And I'm thinking at that moment, like I'd be in the bottom of the boat crying or I'd just jump overboard and give it over with, right? There's, there's no way I could take that. The disciples are in a kind of a situation like these are hardened fishermen. These are people that grew up fishing, people that grew up on these boats. And yet in the middle of this storm, they are afraid. So it shows the size of the storm. It shows the legitimacy of the storm, right? This wasn't just the possibility of a storm coming. No, they were in the middle of it. It was coming for them, and they were there. How did they find hope? How did they find assurance? How did they go from verse 24, being tossed with the waves, to verse number 33, of a truth, thou art the Son of God? They found these anchors that I hope we can hold to this morning. When you're in the middle of a storm, what can we hold to? Number one, first anchor. First anchor we can hold to is, he brought me here. He brought me here. Look at verse number 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him on the other side. He constrained them. He forced them. He convinced them to get into this ship to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Why were the disciples in the ship in the middle of the storm? Because Jesus told them to be there. Because not only did Jesus tell them to be there, Jesus sent them into the middle of the storm. You know, we studied Jonah back in the fall where Jonah was running away from God and God sent a storm to bring him back, right? God sent a storm to challenge him. This storm came not because they were running from the will of God. This storm came because they were in the middle of the will of God. Literally, God himself told them, get into the boat, get into that body of water and go. And then a storm came. This storm was in the will of God. Did Jesus get surprised by the storm? Obviously not. Did Jesus know the storm was coming? Of course he did. Did Jesus know where the storm was coming? Of course he did. Did he deliberately send them into the storm? Yes. He sent them into the midst of this storm. Understand, they were safer in the storm in God's will than on the land in the crowds outside of the obedience of God. God sent them into the storm. We must never judge our security on the basis of the circumstances around us alone. We could never do that. Do not judge your security solely based on the circumstances that surround you. As you read your Bible, there's usually two kinds of storms. Storms of correction, like Jonah, where God disciplines us, where God is um, correcting us. Storms of correction, and then there's storms of perfection, where God helps us to grow where God helps us to be stronger. Jonah was in a storm because he disobeyed God and had to be corrected. The disciples were in a storm because they obeyed God and God was perfecting them. God was growing them. God was challenging them. You remember, uh, Actually, if you look back at Matthew chapter eight, Jesus has done this before. Jesus had tested them in a storm in Matthew chapter eight, but he was in the boat with them that time. That's the one where Jesus is asleep in the bottom of the boat and they shake him, master, don't you care that we're gonna perish? Don't you care that we're gonna die in the middle of the storm? But now he's testing them while he's not in the boat. A lot of Christians have the mistaken idea that obedience to God and faithfulness to God will produce smooth sailing. If I do what God tells me to do, if I'm faithful to what God has told me to do, then my life is going to be easy. Then my life is going to be smooth sailing. Then all of my life is going to be simple. But that's the opposite of what Jesus promised. Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you shall have tribulation. In this world, you shall have difficulties. When we find ourselves in the middle of the storm because we have obeyed the Lord, 
when we find ourselves in the middle of a storm and it's not because we are fleeing from God, but we have obeyed God and yet we still find ourselves in the middle of the situation, we must remember that the God who brought us here will care for us. The God who brought us here will take care of us. The God who brought us here will teach us. There's not a person in this room that the virus we're currently battling as a culture is a result of your individual sin. This is a national situation. This is a global situation. This is something that isn't a, a punishment upon one person, right? This isn't something to correct one person. No, this, this, is a, this isn't something that God has brought an individual to. This is something that God has brought the world into. He, he brought us here. He is the one who's ultimately in control, and we can question that. We can question the reasons why. We can question his motivations for why. But if we, as Christians, acknowledge that God is sovereign and in control, we have to acknowledge that he has brought us to this situation. We are in the middle of this storm. And the fact is that he brought us here. God is still sovereign in this situation. One song that growing up, um, we used to listen to like on repeat uh, in, the, in the house that I grew up in, which is my house. I don't know why I said it that way. It's a weird way of saying my house the house that I grew up in, um, was the song, The Master of the Wind. I don't know if you guys ever heard that. Um, it's an old Southern Gospel song, which if you've never heard of Southern Gospel, um, you're just missing out on a wonderful sector of music of banjo and mandolin and uh, hammer. Have you ever known what a dulcimer is? But no? All right. Well, YouTube it. All right. You're going to have lots of free time in the next couple of weeks. But uh, The Master of the Wind, right? In the middle of the storm. Why, 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 how can we have assurance? Because I know the one who's in charge of all this. He says, I know the maker of the rain. I'm the one who's ultimately in control. And the first assurance I can have is that he is the one who has brought me here. He is the author of my life. He's the one who calls forward my destiny, right? That's when Christ alone says he confirms my destiny. He brought me here. Number two, what's the second assurance? Not only because he brought me here, but the second anchor I can have is that he will come to me. He will come to me. Look at verse number 24. The ship was now in the middle of the sea, tossed with waves for the Wind was contrary. In other words, the wind is just swirling. It's not really blowing one direction. It's just tossing back and forth. And in the fourth watch of the sea, for fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Usually when we face the hard times of life, it feels like God has deserted us. It feels like Jesus has left us. You read the Psalms where David is just emotionally venting in music and in poetry, and he often feels like God seems so far away, right? God seems so unconcerned. Like, how could God I'll be allowing for this to take place? God feels so distant from me. Yet in every Psalm, what do we see at the end? David comes around and says, yet I know you will rescue me. I know you will be my help. I know that you will be my rock. You watch his journey, and it's a journey that many of us have been through over the past few days of, God, where are you? Why aren't you helping the situation? Why are you stopping me? And yet we come back to the assurance of God will help me. God will be there for me. God will be my rock. I love 2 Corinthians 1.8 because Paul, who's this super Christian to us, right, wrote so many books of the New Testament, was in a situation that he was so difficult for him that he actually confesses in 2 Corinthians 1.8, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, so much that we despaired even of life. Like, we were in a situation where I didn't even want to be here anymore, Paul says. Like, it was such a difficult storm, it was such a difficult challenge, it was such a difficult opposition that I didn't even want to, I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to live anymore. But can I tell you, that even when you are in those situations, when you're in the middle of those storms of life, Isaiah 43, 2 says, we now pass through, we now pass us through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with thee. Now, our challenge is he doesn't always come when we think he should. He doesn't always come in the way we think he should. He doesn't always come at the time that we think he best should come because he knows ultimately when we will need him the most. When did he come to the disciples? Look at verse 25. The fourth watch of the night, the middle of the night, when the disciples were, in verse 24, in the middle of the sea. It's as dark as could be in the middle of the sea, right? 
he waited until this ship was as far from land as humanly possible. So that all human hope was gone. What is he doing? He, he's testing his disciples. He's proving his disciples' faith. And that meant removing every possible human prop. Well, these guys are experienced fishermen. What if we went over there to this port? Or what if we, well, we tried to go this direction? No, they're in the middle of the sea. Like, there is no possibility of help. There's no possibility of human intervention. So why did Jesus choose to walk towards them on the sea. This is a picture that all of us have in our minds of Jesus walking on the water. Why would he do that? I think the reason he did it was to show his disciples that the very thing in that moment they feared was only a staircase for God to come to them. Often we fear the difficult circumstances of life. We fear health trials. We feel fear this you know, virus situation, we, we fear bereavement or loss of family members, only to discover that those experiences that we were so afraid of were the actual experiences that God came to us on. They're so scared of the sea, they're so scared of the waves, and yet the waves are the way that Jesus chose to come to him. I always wonder, why didn't they recognize Jesus? They say it's a spirit. Did Jesus take on some, I've seen pictures painted of Jesus like all in white glowing like looks like the nightmare before christmas kind of guy or the uh you know the the what's the scrooge movie the christmas carol uh, like floating towards them no he didn't have some weird form okay he's walking towards them why didn't they recognize jesus i think it's because they weren't looking for him they, they they had jesus up in the mountain we're in the middle of the sea like jesus can't come to us right now jesus can't show up here like we're on our own. They were looking for every possible human intervention. They were not looking for Jesus to come and solve their problem. Had they been waiting by faith with binoculars out? I know he's coming. I know he's coming. I know he's coming. They would have seen a little speck on the horizon of Jesus. There he is, right? They don't know exactly who is coming. They weren't looking for Jesus' intervention. Instead, they jumped to the conclusion that the appearance of someone on the water had to have been a ghost. Fear and faith cannot live in the same heart because fear always blinds the eyes to the presence of the Lord. When I'm living in fear, I'm not talking about being cautious. I'm not talking about being nervous. I'm talking about being fearful, being fearful. Being fearful, that will always blind your eyes to the presence of the Lord in your situation. The one thing they're most terrified of, the creator walks out in control of. The one thing they're most scared of the creator uses an opportunity for him to come to them. Could it be that the things that we're most afraid of are things that God will use to come near to us? He will come to us. He will not leave us in our situation. He just won't always come to us in the way we think he should. He won't always come to us in the way that we expect he would, right? That didn't happen for the disciples. Usually when I'm in a, a situation where I want Christ's help, where I want his intervention. I have a very specific way I want him to do that, right? Okay, I don't have any more money, so the way Christ can help me is by giving me more money, right? By magically sending me a check in the mail, by you know just allowing dollar bills to show up in my bank account, like by some hacker's mistake, he gives me a million dollars. Like I, I have a very specific way. I, this is what I want God to do. I need this. It's usually not the way that he responds. You ever have the situation where God, I really need you to come through, really need you to come through, really need you to come through, and then he does, but not nearly in the way that you expected him to? Maybe, man, I, gotta, I, I really need some financial stability. Instead of giving you an extra check, he makes your car last longer than any automobile ever should, right? Some of you guys drove in those this morning, like, how is this sucker still going, right? That's the goodness of God, right? Or maybe he just allows your furnace to keep clicking, you know? Like, he, he provides for us. He gives us grace. He meets us in our needs. And oftentimes, it is through the exact situation that we are most fearful of that Jesus comes to us on. But not only does he come to us on the thing they're most fearful of, he shows his power and dominion over that which they are most afraid of. He doesn't get on a, a parachute and jump over a, a plane and you know, come jumping down. No, he shows his dominion and his power over the thing that has them terrified. Can I tell you something this morning? That if Jesus chose to, Jesus could walk 
all over this virus. He's in control. He doesn't bow before it. He doesn't fear before it. He isn't trembling before it. Jesus is in ultimate control. This is not greater than his power. It's not greater than his control. It's not outside of his realm of sovereignty. So when I can't see the presence of God, usually it's because my heart is full of fear. So number one, what anchor can I hold to? Well, God's the one that brought me here, right? He brought me into the situation. And if he brought me into the situation, he will come to me. It may not be at the time I think I need him to. It may not be in the way that I think I need him to, but he will. He says, when I press us through the waters, I will be with you. The presence of God is a promise for us. Number three, third anchor when I'm going through a storm is that he will help me grow. He will help me grow. Look at verse number 28. When they finally clicks that who who this is, Peter answers him and says, Lord, if it's really you, if it be thou, bid me come unto you on the water. Everyone else sees this as a scary thing. Peter sees an opportunity. This could be cool, right? I'm gonna walk on the water with him. If it's really you, I wanna come out there with you. Jesus says, verse 29, come. When Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. When he saw the wind was boisterous, he got afraid again and began to sink and cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Look at Peter. And a lot of people can bash Peter in the situation. I've heard a lot of messages on Peter's lack of faith. I've heard a lot of messages on why Peter took his eyes off Jesus and what a loser Peter is. Um, But 11 other dudes are sitting in the boat with their hands folded. Peter at least tried, right? Peter at least had the courage and the the faith to bet on the Lord enough to get out in the first place, right? So he says, if it's you, invite me out there. And Peter steps out and begins to walk on the water. You know what the end results of Peter's life is? 1 Peter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. Peter's, this experience for him, he grows into the one who really leads forward the church into uh, the future, and this is one of the trademark moments of his faith's development. I love what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis said, hardship often prepares an ordinary person for an extraordinary future. What's the difference? You read biographies, I hope you do, and I'm gonna give you a lot of things if you're bored in the next few weeks, read some biographies, though they're awesome, right? But you listen through people's stories. Incredible, people with incredible stories, people with incredible destinies and futures it's unbelievable as you trace their story how much hardship those individuals went through. Hardship often prepares an ordinary person for an extraordinary destiny. In adversity and storms, we usually want God to do a removing job. God, get me out of the storm, right? Make all of this, this, this health scare, make, make all of it drop now, like remove it from our situation. But usually in a storm, God doesn't want to do a removing job. He usually wants to do an improving job. You know, to realize the worth of an anchor, you really have to feel the weight of a storm to be thankful for the anchor you have. We got to feel it. And oftentimes God challenges us and grows our faith through the storms of our life. One of my favorite uh, illustrations of this, there's a scientific experiment they did, this is probably 10 years ago, a behavioral scientist, and I really like behavioral science where you think, figure out how our brains work, right? Uh, they did this experiment where scientists put some rats in a tank of water. And the rat, the, uh, you guys probably heard the story a thousand times. The same people that grimace against the story uh, are the animal lovers in the room. No, but uh, there's, a, there's a tank of water, right? There's no, there's no stairs. It's all smooth. They put the, the rats in there. And uh, so they couldn't escape. They had no place to rest. And they see, just were just kind of trying to see how long they would last, right? Seems kind of cruel, but this is what they did, okay? The average time was 17 minutes. 17 minutes, these could swim, okay? Then they repeated the experiment. But this time, they rescued the rats right before the point of them going under. They dried them off. They returned them to their cages. They fed them. They let them play for a few days. And then they repeated the same experiment. Same type of animal, same exact bull. This time, the average survival time increased from 17 minutes to 36 hours. They explained that phenomenon by pointing out that the second time around, the rats had what we know in the Bible as hope. They believed they could survive this. 
because before they had received a helping hand. That's the whole purpose of the storm, to help the disciples grow in their faith. Because eventually Jesus isn't just going to be on the mountain and there's sort of the sea. He's, he's going to leave them, and they are going to face incredible storms in their lives. They had to learn to trust him even if he wasn't physically present with them, and even though it looked as though they were outside of his care. If you look at Peter, Peter takes us this special kind of person of real faith to leave the boat and walk on the water. So he's out there and he's walking on the water. What caused Peter to sink? So his faith began to waver when he took his eyes off of the Lord and began to look at the circumstances around him. Jesus asked, asked him, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? That word doubt is, it gives the concept of two different paths. Like where you're, where you're, ladies, you're at a restaurant and you're deciding between number four and a number nine, okay? I'm really doubting my decision. What if I get a number four and I really wish I would have got a number nine? Maybe my wife's the only one who's in that situation who just does that. But like, uh, what if I get the wrong thing? Well, get them both, right? Just buy them both and then we can continue and the line behind us can pass. No, but um, no, you're in that situation where you're like, I don't know which path to go on. Peter, it says, was, was stuck between two. I don't know who to look at. I don't know whether to look at the Lord or to look at the, the waves that are surrounding him. Peter starts out with great faith, but ends up with little faith because he saw two options instead of one option. We have to give Peter credit at least for knowing the right option when he began to sink, right? He didn't say, waves, please help me, right? He said, Lord, please help me, right? Lord, help me. The storms of life are not easy, but they are necessary. For Peter, this experience was so difficult that it helped him grow in his knowledge of himself and his knowledge of the Lord. They teach us to trust and to obey God's word no matter what these evidences or circumstances may be around us. One of my favorite quotes about faith is that faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. I'm, I'm going to do what God asked me to do, regardless of what these consequences may look like in this moment. I know that he will help me grow. Take this moment not only as self-preservation. I'm not saying we don't want to wash our hands. We have hand sanitizer like everywhere in this building, okay? Uh, Sarah's walking around with spray, and John Mark's been wiping down everything. We want to be wise, okay? But at the same time, don't just think of this situation as how do I preserve myself? How do I preserve my family? Think of this as what, how can I grow through this, right? How can I develop through this? For some of you, maybe this is the first time that you're really feeling the strength of your anchor. This is maybe the first time in a long time, maybe the first time since you've become a Christian that you've really been tossed to and fro, or you've really been confused about which way is up. I want to encourage you to test the strength of your anchor. He is strong enough to handle this for you. Number four, and I'll be done. Number four, he will see me through. He will see me through. Look at verse 32. When they were come into the ship, Peter and Jesus, the wind ceased. The wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshiped it, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. If Jesus says, Come, come to me, or go, right, then that word is going to accomplish its intended purpose. Hebrews 12 says he is the author of our faith, but he's also the finisher of our faith. Right? That he which hath begun a good work in you will complete it. Right? That's what we just saw in Philippians chapter 1. This is the promise of God, that he that begins this work in you will see it to its completion. We may fail along the way, but God will succeed. We may fail in our Christian journey, but God will succeed in our Christian journey. Jesus and Peter walked on the water together and then they went to the ship and Peter's experience turned out to be a blessing to the other disciples as well. When they saw the power of Jesus Christ in conquering the storm and calming the storm, they, their only rational response was to fall down and worship him, was to fall down and worship Christ. To say, uh, when Jesus calmed the first storm, the disciples said, what manner of man is this? In Matthew chapter eight. What kind of dude is this? What manner of man is this that the winds and waves obey him? But now look at their testimony. Six chapters later, of a truth, thou art the son of God. Jesus calms the storm the first time around. 
well, there's something different about this guy. Like, this cat is something different, right? There's, we need to stick around for a little while, figure out what's going on with him. After they experience this journey, because they've been grown and developed and challenged, what do they say? Thou art the Son of God. You are the Messiah. The disciples had helped feed 5,000 people. And then God permitted them to go, to a, go through a storm. In the book of Acts, they won to Christ or to the faith 5,000 people. And then the storm of persecution began. It's no doubt for me and the, that the Peter and the disciples recalled their first storm experience and took courage in their second. This, this miracle magnifies the control of Jesus Christ. When Matthew wrote this same story, um, or wrote Peter's request, bid me to come, he uses a word there that's like uh, when you walk into a king's presence, they say, am I allowed to be welcomed? Like, can I, can I come in? Like the bid me to come was like the command of a king. Peter is acknowledging that Jesus is the king over all of nature, including the winds and the waves, including the viruses and the sicknesses, right? Jesus is the king. His word is law and the elements must obey it. The ship then lands at Gennesaret, which is near Capernaum, and uh, there Jesus goes on to heal a lot of different people. My question is, did these people know that he had come through this storm to meet their needs? Do we remember that he endured the storm of judgment for us? That's what Psalm 42 says, that he endured the storm for us that we might never face the judgment of God. God will see us through. You will get to the other side. Your faith will be completed. It will be finished. Your spiritual journey will never end before God says it should end. We have moments where the, the biggest fear for us, usually as, as humans, is the end of our life, right? It, it's, it's death. It's when this chapter ends for us. But just like we saw two weeks ago, what did Paul say? Hey, for me to live... Man, I'm going to go and impact as many people as I can. And if you choose to take this life from me, I'm going to be eternally in the presence of Christ. It removes that fear. It removes that opposition. I couldn't help but think of the parallels between the situation we were in over the past seven days and the, the passages we've been studying in Philippians chapter one, where it seems like every day we're getting stepped in another direction. But my question is, does our faith have the enemy in that checkmate that we talked about, Right? Or he can't win, or is every new opportunity for us, oh no, it's a, is, this is happening, and oh no, this is going to happen, and oh, oh, oh then now, did you see this news report, and did you see this article, and did you, did you see this blog post, did you see this person's letter, did, and we're getting tossed back and forth, and everything is just increasing our anxiety, it's increasing our fear, or hey, you know what, if, if this is here, and I'm going to wash my hands, I'm going to be careful, I'm not going to be in groups of a zillion people, and I'm going to try and do my best to take care of myself, my family, but hey, if I get to live, man, for me to live is Christ, and if this thing gets terrible, 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 and it ends up with the worst possible results, and it's you know, the end for me, then I'm going to be eternally in the presence of my Savior. So you know what? I, I'm not going to live with this anxiety and this, this fear, this terror. Um, my favorite author is C.S. Lewis, um, and he had this, this letter. I'm going to see if I can pull it up. I should have planned this better, but I have to get it here. Um, he wrote this letter. In his day, the thing that people were freaking out with was the atomic bomb. Um, people were really nervous that at any random moment, an atomic bomb was going to drop on them and all of life was going to be over. So they're all hunkered down in these, um, these bunkers that the atomic bomb could just obliterate, but they were hiding in bunkers anyways, like um, just to try and protect themselves. And he wrote this, this and I'll, I'll end with it. So... He says, in one way, I think we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb, okay? If you want to replace it in your mind, atomic bomb with coronavirus, okay? In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? Well, I'm tempted to reply, why, as you lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London and almost every year or so, you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night or... Indeed, as you are living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, uh, we've been facing stuff for a long, long time, right? In other words, he says, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. 
Believe me, sir or madam, you and all whom you love, we were all sentenced to an eventual death long before the atomic bomb was invented. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, and we still have that. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of a painful and premature death to a world which was already brisk with such chances, in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. He says, we, we're always, we always knew that this was going to be the end result for humanity. Just because someone created a new way for it to happen, why are we all melting down about it? To this point, he says, and the first action for us to take is to pull ourselves together. If we're all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, then let that bomb come when it finds us doing sensible and normal human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, giving our kids baths, playing tennis, chatting to our friends in a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, but they need not dominate our minds. Understand, if this thing is as bad as some people think it is, and it ends up doing what some people think it might, my encouragement to us is that we do not live with it dominating our minds. Okay, I hope that you're wise. The kids are out of school, so obviously there's going to be some weirdness to it. Um, I'm trying to figure out what we're going to do with my son at home for the next three weeks. Uh, we've lasted two days, and it's not going exceptionally well. No, we're trying to figure out, like, let's create some schedules here, right? Um, props to all the homeschoolers in the room, because, man, wow, that's a lot of my kid all the time, right? But, um, you know, trying to have that and trying to think through this. So there's going to be some changes that take place. There's going to be a new normal we try to find. But I want to encourage you, don't live with that whimpering and that drawing long face of, oh, no. They said now it's in this town, and now it's here, and now it's here. I want to be surprised by some news. That's my goal. I, maybe I'll check the news once a day, and I want to be actually be surprised, not investigating, trying to find out if something new is taking place. Oh, did they find it here? Did they find it? No. Like, oh, it's in here. Oh, wow, yeah, I didn't know that because I was grilling hot dogs outside or because you know I was going for a walk with my kids or because I was going about my day as normal as I can or I'm trying to play a lot of board games, you know, I'm hanging, like, just don't let it dominate your minds. You are in a situation where it's unique to our American 21st century world, but it's not unique to the Christian experience. Imagine being a first century Christian where you're gathering together to worship and wondering, are the Romans going to show up at church today? Like, are the Romans going to be, are they going to take us away? Are they going to, are we going to, you know, like, to live with that kind of, that, that's not unique to us. We're not the first people to ever face an uncertain situation. We're not the first Christians to ever face an uncertain situation. My hope is that we face it with reality, we face it with love to our neighbors, and we face it holding to these anchors we talked through this morning in the middle of a storm. You know, I, God brought me here, so he's in control. He's going to come to me. He's going to help me. I will not be alone through this. God, how can I grow? Like, okay, how can my faith be challenged in this? How can I be developed in this? How can I, my faith be stronger at the end of this than it was at the beginning of this? And I know that at the end of this, he's going to see me through it. He's going to deliver me. Victory is the promise for every Christian. We just usually don't quite understand the victory the Lord offers us. But my hope is that we leave here with a little bit more hope, okay? My hope is that we leave here with a little bit more smiles. My hope is that we leave here as an ability, with an ability to interact with your neighbors, with your friends, with your community, even on Facebook, as crazy as it is right now, right? Even on there with a, with a level of, calm-spirited, cautious awareness of the reality, but a hope-filled confidence that God is in control, that we're not melting down as the world melts down around us. You know, Paul write, or Peter writes in 1 Peter, he says, I want you to be ready. Ready for what? He says, ready to give an answer to them who asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you. My question is, is the way that people around us... Has, is the way that we're responding, prompting the people who are watching us, prompting our family and our friends to ask you, hey, uh, why do you have so much hope in this? Because the world does not right now. And it, it, you know, I was talking to Dean before church, if you didn't have the hope of eternal life after this life, we might be melting down too, right? If, because death is the worst thing that can happen to someone who doesn't know what's gonna happen after this. Right? So we'd probably be fearful. Don't mock them. Don't ridicule them. I shouldn't be so scared or whatever. You know, just 
but they should see how you're responding. Say, hey, how, how come you're not totally freaked out by this? Well, I definitely don't want to get it, but ultimately God's in control and ultimately I trust in him and I'm going to be careful. I'm going to, well, how do you have that hope? Well, I know that even if the worst possible result happens, I'm going to be with Christ, that he's going to see me through. My greatest burden through this is that I, I genuinely believe that God is going to use this to set off the light bulb in a lot of people's heads of the fragility of their lives, of the tough 21st century American context that we have, that we pulled ourselves by our own bootstraps, and all it takes is a little microbe to set us into a, you know, toilet paper buying rampage, right? Like, that, that's just all it takes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to set off some light bulbs in people's minds of what, what is really out there and why am I here and who is really, really in control of this. And my hope is they find a group of Christians, at least localized here in Torrington, Connecticut, right, in our corner, that are responding with hope, that are responding with graciousness, that are responding with love to those who are affected, but ultimately they see how we're reacting and say, that's, I want to live with that kind of confidence. I want to live with that kind of assurance. I want to live with that kind of hope in our hearts. First, though, we have to have it, okay? So before we can show it forth to other people, we've got to have that assurance. We've got to have that confidence. We've got to have that hope. So wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, and then live as a hopeful Christian, okay? Because there's still good days ahead of us. There's still positive things happening in our future. And ultimately, God has promised that if he told you to get into a boat to go to the other side, you will get to the other side. Okay, let's have a repair together. Heavenly Father, we love you.